We've talked about controls before, but they are applied to mitigate cybersecurity risk. And so we split those into physical, technical, and administrative, and they function to prevent uh, incidents from happening. They allow us to detect when incidents are happening, and they are also corrective if an incident has happened. So technical controls, or sometimes called logical controls, are the use of hardware or software to manage access and provide protection to assets. So examples include authentication methods, encryption, anti-malware software, intrusion detection and protection systems, and firewalls. Administrative controls are an organization's policies and procedures defined by its security policies. So they focus on personnel and business practices, and examples of these include your hiring practices, security screening, data classification and labeling, and security awareness training. So it's interesting in an organization to think about the hiring practices and whether actually uh, organizations do undertake any type of security screening. And that will, develop, that will depend on their maturity in terms of their risk uh, assessment process, but also the risk that they perceive from employees. Uh, typically, uh, most HR should at least perform a police check. Um, now, obviously, you know, that's what you do then if you find something is, is really up to the organization itself. It doesn't necessarily preclude people from being hired but at least you're aware of it. And certainly when you're in sensitive areas, like for example, working with children, uh, working with people in a health scenario, then screening of that sort is commonplace. Physical controls are those that prevent, monitor or detect unauthorized access to assets. And examples of these include lock systems, CCTV, swipe cards, man traps, and alarms. So a man trap, in case you aren't familiar with the term, is where you use a rotating barrier door, for example, uh, which can be locked automatically. Another approach is where uh, people uh, enter from into, into a space from one door. That door has to shut behind them before the, the other door opens. The uh, aim of man traps of this sort is to try and stop um, people uh, basically being able to come in um, on the back of somebody. So if you go up and uh, essentially tailgate uh, somebody coming into an organization, you can sometimes slip through. But if you make it so that only individuals can come in one at a time, it makes it harder for somebody to do that, especially doing it unnoticed. Um, if somebody's just swiping in, it's very easy to tailgate and get into an, uh, through a door. Deterrent controls are those that discourage violation of security policies through visible warnings and consequences for violators. So examples of this include security awareness training, locks, fences, security badges, guards, man traps, and security cameras. Preventive controls are controls that aim to stop violation of security policies. Whilst they're similar to deterrents, Preventative controls are far harder to casually violate than deterrents. So examples of those include locks, biometrics, alarm systems, separation of duties, data classification, penetration testing, uh, firewalls, IPS, anti-malware software, etc. So important to distinguish between preventive controls and deterrence controls. Detective controls are concerned with detecting or discovering malicious activity during or after it has occurred. And again, examples of this include audit trails, logging, honeypots and honey nets, CCTV and intrusion detection systems. So we've seen this chart before. It gives you an example of the control functions, control types, and then what goes into those different categories. And it's worth familiarizing yourself with this because, you know, it's an easy question to ask in an exam. In implementing security operations, there are a number of different principles and approaches taken to this. One of those is need to know and least privilege. 
The aim of this is to keep secrets secret. So we only grant users and systems access to the data and resources they need for their specific duties. So even if somebody is cleared, for example, at a top secret level, if they're not involved in a particular operation, then they don't need to know about it. In an organization that's creating new products, then a new product team might um, need to know, but nobody outside of that team uh, needs to know about that new product. By limiting the amount of spread of information or secrets, then it's easier to control and it's far harder than for it to leak. Another approach is separation of duties and responsibilities. So we never put a single person in charge of an entire function. And that um, also involves uh, putting cybersecurity responsibilities outside of IT. The point here being that we don't want the people implementing systems that are also to be the ones that are checking them. So separation of duties and responsibilities can be in, in, implemented in a number of different scenarios. For example, in, in a finance area, then the people who are um, creating orders uh, or doing payments shouldn't necessarily be the ones that sign the checks, for example. Two-person control is where we don't have one person who's responsible for an entire uh, function. Again, it sort of helps pretend, pre prevent uh, fraud. Job rotation, so uh, this also helps with the highlighting of uh, uh, irregularities and potentially fraud that's happened, and uh, as does mandatory vacations. Um, taking, forcing staff to go on mandatory holidays is uh, a good way of seeing whether something changes while that person is away. So if there were pay regular payments being made, for example, and they stop when the person goes away, um, and then you could potentially highlight that there was an irregularity there. Privileged account management is having a specific function looking at who has privileges, uh, making sure that they're revoked when they're not needed or when that person leaves the organization and restricting who has access uh, to privileged access. Change management is implementing a system of uh, making changes to an organization where that's controlled, uh, checked and signed off so that people can't make changes indiscriminately um, and also that changes that are made are not going to impact the organization. In terms of personnel security, undertaking security awareness training is important. So that might be sending phishing emails and showing them you know, how not to click on links, but also about preserving passwords, using multi-factor authentication, etc. Mobile device management and working from home is uh, an important feature that's been highlighted over the past couple of years now. Um, and, and especially during the pandemic. Uh, so that's introduced a range of new challenges to organizations who are now working outside of the corporate environment, uh, potentially using their own, bring your own device, their own um, device that they're mixing with uh, their personal use. And that brings around its own challenges. Information management life cycles, where we worry about the creation, storage, use, archiving, destruction, and purging of information. And that can be um, everything from paper through to um, other types of media, uh, through to obviously digital files. Getting rid of a computer with a disk uh, may involve actually destroying that disk in a secure way. Uh, and part of that may be actually putting them through Microwaves, um, if they're SSDs um, and other uh, electromagnetic pulse devices uh, for magnetic tapes, um, but also shredding, actually shredding chips uh, using commercially available uh, hardware. Hardware and software, asset management, uh, protection of those assets, controlling access to machines, uh, cooling and fire prevention are all important. Virtual assets, um, obviously, and then um, things like licensing and software license agreements, which are integral to security operations. 
So actually considerations around security are quite broad and there are a number of different roles within all of this. But um, uh, in most organizations that uh, do undertake uh, these types of processes, there will be somebody who is responsible overall for ensuring that all aspects are covered.